Welcome everyone to the first edition of our new JDCA series, Road to 2024. We're gonna look at a, a few different issues concerning the upcoming election and what we can do to prepare, organize, and ensure that Democrats win. I'm Izzy Klein, JDCA board member and political chair. And today's event is going to focus on voting rights. It's hard to believe, but we are exactly one year, one month, and two days away from election day 2024. And while that might seem far off, at Jewish Dems, we know that right now is the time to get organized, to get involved, and to get to work. And you can start by visiting jewishdems.org and signing up to join a state or local chapter or an affiliate and by becoming a member of the JDCA. The 2020 election and its aftermath cemented for many of us that we are dealing with a new class of Republican extremists. The Republican Party, as directed by their dear leader, Donald Trump, sees subverting democracy as the clear path to victory. And they will attempt to achieve that through any means necessary. That includes voter suppression, gerrymandered maps, voter intimidation, uh, attacking the vote by mail system, and as we saw on January 6th, an actual armed insurrection. Since its founding in 2017, JDCA has consistently advocated to defend democracy, voting rights, and election integrity. We have sent over 8,000 letters to Congress demanding protections for those rights. We have focused on electing candidates committed to defending democracy. We also convene and mobilize our members, like all of you joining us today, to learn from experts like our special guest, Secretaries of State Cisco Aguilar, Jocelyn Benson, and Adrian Fontes, and our moderator, Brian Tyler Cohen. Our program today will be split into two parts. First, we'll hear from Brian Tyler Cohen. Brian's a premier political commentator, host of the podcast, No Lie, with Brian Tyler Cohen, an MSNBC contributor, and a longtime friend of JDCA. After we hear from Brian on how we can be more effective messengers for the Democratic Party, we'll Brian will moderate a conversation between the Secretaries of State uh, on voting rights. Uh, let's dive in. Brian. Welcome to the program today. Thanks so much for having uh, me. I know that you're usually used to asking the questions uh, of Democrats, including President Biden and, and other leaders. But given your expertise, we thought we'd ask you some questions to start off. Cool. Let's do it. So you've been one of the most effective messengers for Democrats, um, particularly online, um, you know, Twitter, now known as X. What have you learned um, to most effectively engage younger voters, mm -hmm. independent or swing voters, and, and what do we think, you know, their impact on the election will be in 2024? Yeah, so I think that something that's going to really benefit us is keeping our messages simple. I think that is the biggest thing. I mean, Democrats have a tendency. I know the Al Franken joke is a Democratic slogan will just be all of our priorities and then if if like we put it on a bumper sticker it would be all of our priorities and said and it would say continued on next bumper sticker so that's what democrats have done historically i think that keeping it simple is going to be the best thing for us i mean we have some issues that are beyond potent right now um obviously overturning roe is one of them women's reproductive rights the potency of that issue like couldn't possibly be be overstated because I mean, look what's happening in states like Kansas, states like Ohio, which are otherwise not even close to being uh, liberal bastions. And yet we're having the majority of people come out to vote in support of the democratic position on these issues. Um, and obviously we would like to see that issue become more present, whether it's by ballot initiatives or referendums uh, for the 2024 election. And hopefully we will see some of those. And I'm gonna speak to uh, some of the secretaries of state about that issue coming up. But um, focusing on some of these simple issues. I mean, you know, even even when when Joe Biden came into office, the big thing was like this build back better agenda and it was nebulous. Nobody really knew what it was. And it's hard to to like it's hard to extol the virtues of legislation when it is so nebulous, because when you go out to actual people out there, nobody knows what the hell anything is like. If you, but if you can come forward and say like this is a bill to lower the cost of of prescription drugs, if this is a bill to to get the price of insulin down to thirty five dollars 
a, a vial. Like that is going to be what's going to most effectively help us. And we have a lot of those issues that we're on the right side of. We had record funding for climate. That's something that we should absolutely promote. We have um, we have capping out of pocket healthcare costs at two thousand dollars a year for seniors. We have um, uh, the issue of Dobbs, of course. So I think focusing on those very simple issues that voters know what they are and that it impacts their life is going to help us most um, in the end. It's going to help us with young voters who aren't, you know, accustomed to all this. Like they don't want to hear that that BS about like nebulous issues and omnibus stuff. They don't know what it is. They just want issues that are going to impact their life and they're that and, and they don't have a, a long attention span. And this is the kind of stuff that they'll be paying attention to. Um, swing voters and independent voters, of course, are the same way. I mean, these are not extremists and the agenda that Republicans are putting forward is an extreme agenda. So I think focusing on those simple issues that appeal to the to a broad swath of Americans is going to help us. That, thanks, Brian. That, that's um, w well said. You hinted on the um, potential enthusiasm gap among among voters um, for going into 2024 that may not have existed in 2020 for a variety of reasons. What do you what do you say to people who who sort of talk about this anxiety um, about the enthusiasm gap and and what can folks do, you know, now a, a year from the election to to try to make a difference on on that front? Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm actually not very worried about that because I mean we're still a year out. Most of the people who pay attention in a general election aren't paying attention right now anyway. I mean this is this is us uh, like us kind of uh, airing our anxiety uh, just among among other people who are highly informed, like high information voters who are paying attention to politics a year out from the general election. Most people have no idea what's going on. They're going to tune in somewhere around eight to 10 months from now. I th so I think for us, it's just going to naturally like we'll, we'll have we'll, we'll naturally fall into line. People are going to start naturally paying attention. And, you know, the same uh, uh, the same candidates who garnered so much attention ahead of 2020, Joe Biden and Donald Trump are going to very likely be the candidates on the ballot this go around in 2024. So in terms of people paying attention to yet another election cycle where Trump and Biden are on the ballot and then you have added issues of Republican extremism. You know, this is the first general election after the January 6th insurrection. This is the first general election after uh, Donald Trump's right wing court overturned Roe. So I think there's going to be those issues. I would not worry about whether people are paying attention or not, because I think that's going to come naturally. But what people can do is just to make sure that these issues that they care about, that their family and friends care about, that those stay at top of mind. Thanks. And and I, I, I agree. There's there's a lot of hand wringing and sometimes it happens a little a little too early nowadays. Yeah. Um, so looking ahead, what what races do you think are going to be the most competitive and, and where should we as Jewish Dems sort of focus our um, our efforts to ensure that Democrats can can win in 2024? So I put this into two buckets. And the first I feel like is the obvious one. It's the swing states. I mean, our secretaries of state who've joined us today are from Michigan and Arizona and Nevada. And obviously those states are, are monumentally important. We've got other swing states, you know, where, where Democrats can actually be on offense, states like Texas and Florida. Um, but then there's another bucket. And, and those those obviously the important of the, the importance of those states can't be overstated. I mean, that that is that is the whole ball game, you know, but then we have House seats as well, um, which I think are important to focus on states like New York and California, which are otherwise overlooked. I mean, the attention very rightfully goes to the swing states of of Arizona and Michigan and Wisconsin and uh, to a lesser degree, Ohio. But but um, but but those states, those um, regular battleground states. But we do have a number of House seats that are going to be up in New York and California. And because those big blue liberal bastions don't get the same kind of attention that the battleground states get, um, I think that can that that usually you know doesn't help us in terms of the House. And so we have a great opportunity here to swing back as many as six seats when the New York maps are redrawn. And we have also a great opportunity with Adam Schiff and Katie Porter and Barbara Lee on the ballot in, in uh, for the Senate race to garner a lot of enthusiasm for that race right there, which will in turn help down ballot. And we have a ton of races in California, California's 41st, California's 26th, where Republicans are occupying seats in what is otherwise like the most progressive state in the country, uh, Republicans are winning super close races. And so this is a great opportunity to focus on some of those big blue uh, liberal states to, to kind of claw back some of the seats that we shouldn't have lost in 2020 and 2022. Um, but I think we have a good opportunity to bring them back now. So those are the two buckets. I, I do think that we definitely need to keep focusing on 
the battleground states. The reasons are obvious, but you know we do have some great opportunities even to to win back the House or expand a House majority thanks to states like California and New York. Thanks, Brian. Um, great, great points all around. One more quick question, and then I want to shift over to our, the second and probably much more interesting part for for our audience um, of of the uh, of the program tonight. Um, the, um, the the term Bidenomics, coined by um, a Wall Street Journal col columnist, uh, you know, a year or so ago, um, that's now been um, taken for a ride by by the administration um, in in the you know, more public relations um, setting. How are you, are, are you interpreting that? Um, does this does this sort of help us? Is is this sort of a distraction? What, what are your what are your kind of gut feelings on it? Well, I think the White House's lead here is the right one, which is to embrace this stuff. I mean, we saw this with Obamacare, right, where Republicans tried to brand because they have such mm -hmm. such oozing contempt for Barack Obama when he was in office. They were like, well, let's just brand the ACA Obamacare and let Americans feelings about Obama do the rest because they wrongly assume that everybody hates him as much as they did. Um, he was like, screw it. Let's let's embrace it. This is Obamacare. And Obamacare is so popular that even the Republican majority couldn't get rid of it. And so I think Bidenomics is is the same thing. I mean, People can very clearly see the distinction. Um, you know, it was named that way to draw a contrast between that and Reaganomics. And I think this idea of trickle down economics is just so thoroughly debunked, so thoroughly dis uh, uh, hated by the vast majority of Americans, this idea of trickle down economics, where if you just continue to pander, continue to pout kowtow to the richest Americans, that eventually whatever crumbs filter down is what is is what we should be content with. And I think just that idea is is um, is so detestable and so detested in this country right now that being able to have a very clear contrast in Bidenomics, which is expressly benefiting Americans economically from the bottom up or the middle up, um, is is what we should really be leaning into, and it's working. I mean, we've added thirteen and a half million jobs. We've there's been no been no tax cut for the wealthiest uh, you know Americans, millionaires and billionaires. It's it's bringing the unemployment rates down, not just not just to a fifty year low, but even record lows among women and people of color. So I think that this is definitely something that Democrats um, should lean into. Thanks, thanks, Brian, um, and thank you for all of your your insight and, and all the work that you do on a, on a daily basis to help us defend democracy. Um, joining us now are the defenders of democracy on, on the front lines. Um, Secretaries of State Cisco Aguilar of Nevada, uh, Jocelyn Benson of Michigan, and Adrian Fontes of Arizona. Um, what, a, what, a, what an honor, uh, what a thrill uh, for, for me personally and for all of us to, to be able to hear from you um, all today. Um, Secretary, uh, brief introductions. Secretary Aguilar was elected Nevada Secretary of State in 2022. Uh, prior to that, uh, he was the uh, general counsel for, for 12 years for the Agassiz Craft um, uh, Management Company uh, and the Andre Agassiz Foundation for Education. Um, grateful for all, all of your work there. Uh, Secretary Benson became Michigan's 43rd Secretary of State after the 2018 election, uh, becoming the first Democrat to hold the office since 95. In her role, uh, Benson oversaw Michigan's 2020 and 2022 general elections, both of which drew record-breaking turnout and were more secure than any prior election in state history, earning her national uh, and well-earned re recognition. Uh, Secretary Fontes of Arizona is a former Marine and attorney, uh, was elected in 2022 after serving as the Maricopa County Recorder from 2017 until 2021. In 2020, at the height of the COVID-19 crisis, and amid violent protests, Secretary Fontes oversaw Maricopa County's record voter turnout, um, as well as record numbers of new voters registered for both parties. All three of these leaders have unique wisdom and experience on the fight for voting rights, and we look forward to learning directly from them. We are thankful to have them join us. And before I pass it back to Brian to continue today's conversation, um, I should have done this at the top. But just a, a moment of silence for the loss of Senator Dianne Feinstein in California. Um, just a, a moment of silence. Thank you. Brian, it is off to you. 
Thanks, Izzy. And uh, thank you, all three of you, for being here. I mean, the you, you know, I, I, there's really nothing I could say that could underscore the importance of the work that you all do. Um, we have a lot of important stuff to get to, but first, uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't open the floor for a very brief airing of grievances because it's come to our attention that all Secretary of State offices are not created equal. So, uh, Secretary Fontes, if you would like to let your feelings be known, now, now is the time. Um, the grievance is about what? I'm having a great time. Uh, <laughs> I just mean we're, we're enjoying the heck out of what's going on. Challenges be damned. We're going to keep pushing through to at the end. No, uh, thank you so much, Brian. It's always good to be with you. And thank you for uh, the Jewish Dems for bringing us together. Uh, I don't have a lot of grievances this morning against anybody who's here, but I'm just, you know, I'm happy to be here and I'm willing to get the conversation going. All right. Well, we, I'll, I'll leave, uh, I'll leave the conversation about uh, your curtains off to, uh, you know, well, well, you're talking, you're talking about the declaration. I was, I was, when I said Secretary of State offices, I mean the physical office. Okay. Okay. Well, you got to be more clear because this whole Marine takes direction. So I'm talking <laughs> about the big office, but I want everybody to look at Cisco's beautiful curtains. These like vintage 1984 blinds that I've got. And, and I will note uh, either Jocelyn doesn't have any curtains because they're undergoing budget. Oh, she does. Oh, you got those fancy. Oh, you got the, okay. Yeah, so blind. like, vertical blinds. She's got the, the 1990s vertical blinds. I got the horizontals from the 80s. And, and you know, Cisco, we're all jealous. Hey, when you're in an 1860 building and you're in Carson City, you know, it's not easy being in Carson City every day. <laughs> we do right, got to well, get some stuff for your walls, though, Cisco. We need some, <laughs> we need some yeah. like, pro-democracy paraphernalia <laughs> on your walls. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's jump in here. Uh, we have polling from the nonpartisan Jewish Electorate Institute that's consistently shown that since January 6th, the future of democracy is one of the top issues for Jewish American voters. You all are obviously on the front lines of defending democracy. So as the officials who administer the 2024 election, who are set to administer this upcoming election, what do you foresee in your respective states as being the biggest threats to democracy in this coming year? And we can start with, uh, with, uh, with Secretary Benson. I think it's misinformation and lies and the impact of those lies, whether it be violence targeting voters or election officials, or a loss or further loss of, of faith in the democracy itself, both of which are goals of those who um, further those lies. I should mention, I started my career investigating white supremacist organizations and neo-Nazi organizations with the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, and I think it's really important to draw the connections as someone who at the same time when I was doing that saw in 2000, how a secretary of state in Florida interfered with a recount, uh, the, the connection between the work we're doing in elections and the work to ensure we have a diverse and inclusive society where everyone is free to thrive and prosper. And the battles that we're fighting today um, uh, that are rooted in lies and misinformation are also rooted in racism and anti-Semitism and otherism and the uh, same pieces that we've seen flow throughout our the history of our democracy and the history of our country. So I think it's important for us and certainly for the caucus and others to call out that reality, to make those connections. It's no surprise that amidst all of the political drama of the day that we're seeing this rise in both anti-Semitism uh, and this rise in autocracy and anti-democracy speech or anti-democracy efforts, I guess you could say, and mis the misinformation that underlies both of those trends uh, come uh, at the same time. And so I think it's important for us to recognize those threats and recognize the connections between them and, and call them all out as connected and equally um, anti-American and anti-democratic. Thank you. And uh, uh, Secretary Aguilar, same question. What do you foresee as be being the biggest threat to democracy in the coming year? Yeah, and I think Jocelyn or Secretary Benson mentioned it's disinformation. But before we get to disinformation, it's about election workers and poll workers. It's making sure that we are there to protect the poll workers that are sitting in the polling sites, helping us make sure, preserve our democracy. In Nevada, we've made huge efforts to protect election workers. We passed a bill to make it a felony to harass or intimidate them. But we also passed some anti-doxing legislation 80% of work, election workers and poll workers are women. Those are our sisters, those are our daughters, those are our wives, those are our mothers. They're doing what we need them to do to preserve the democracy. They are our unsung heroes of elections. 
And we need to recognize it. Not everybody wants to go work in a space where they feel afraid. We have to take that stigmatism away. We have to stand up for election workers and we got to give them the tools they need to be able to do the job we need them to do to make sure our elections are well run. Without them, we can't do this. And I see that as the biggest threat. It's the human component of our elections that are most at risk right now. I think uh, Secretary Fontes will mention this in Arizona and Nevada. We're in a similar situation. 11 of our 17 clerks across this state are new to elections, or not new to elections, but they're new to their post as clerks. Thankfully, we have some major, you know, some clerks have stepped up. They've been in the election space for a couple of decades. They know what needs to happen. They're also bringing their new ideas and fresh perspective to the job to ensure that we're getting the voter engagement we need to get the results for the 2024 election. Thanks so much. And of course, Secretary Fontes. Yeah, I uh, absolutely agree uh, with Secretary Benson and Secretary Aguilar. Um, it is the misinformation and disinformation that leads, uh, in many cases, unfortunately, to the threats of violence and actual violence. And then that results in the turnover. Uh, you know, uh, the Nevada and Arizona were part of the uh, issue one report that came out last week, speaking to 11 Western states. Uh, think about this, folks. 98% of Arizona's voters in 2024 will have a new chief election administrator, one of the two, either a new election director or new county recorder. We call them recorders here in Arizona. Uh, that's a lot. And we've lost uh, senior election officials in 12 of our 15 counties, uh, which is severe. It's not just significant, it's a very big deal. So it is the human component uh, as, uh, as, as Secretary Aguilar indicated. Uh, and this is a people business. We're here to serve our democracy and our democracy is made up of people, people voting, people administering the elections. Uh, but it all does stem from that original biggest problem, biggest issue. Uh, and I could not say it better than uh, Secretary Benson said, it is the misinformation that has infected uh, our airwaves, it's infected social media. And for some reason, uh, you know, there's just a lot of people that want to continue with the big lie. Uh, and that hurts America. Uh, it hurts America, it hurts all of us. Well, I do want to build on that point, and the floor is open for anybody um, who might be able to weigh in on this. But in light of what we saw with Shay Moss and Ruby Freeman, and, and to every to the point of everything that you've all said thus far, I mean, th there have been poll workers who've been pushed out of doing what they what they had done for years because they're worried about the impacts to their own safety. So ha in any of your states, has that created a vacuum in these positions that's being filled by right wing extremists? And is that a worry? And is anything being done to rectify that issue? And the floor is open for anybody if anybody wants to weigh in. Yeah, we we actually have uh, had folks uh, from the wrong side of the tracks on these issues, I will say, fill some of these spots. Um, and I'll give you a story about Yavapai County, Arizona, the greater Prescott area, sort of north and west of uh, the Phoenix metro area. Um, they lost their county recorder up there because somebody poisoned her dog. And it was under those basic threats. And by the way, Deep Red County, and she was a Republican, a very stalwart Republican, by the way. She used to, she and I used to go butt heads on different issues, but uh, she left. And the person who came in to replace her, we were worried about because she was one of the folks who had been, uh, you know, chatting up some of these mythologies and, and conspiracy theories. Here's the most interesting part about this story. She was there for a couple of months and then flipped 180 degrees after seeing the work, after seeing the processes, after being on the inside and learning from the folks that had been in that office for a long time about how well elections in that county had been run here for, for those Arizona voters. And, and so to repeat a little bit of, of what Cisco said, you know, a lot of the folks that are coming on board now, not only do they have new ideas, new ideas and new energy, but they know what they're getting into. They understand the landscape. And it's that courageous step forward it really gives me hope, uh, even though we're still uh, missing out on, on several spots around Arizona trying to find folks, the folks that are coming forward, uh, they get it and, and they're pushing forward bravely uh, for all of us. If anybody else wants to weigh in, Secretary yeah, Benson, I would add to that. I mean, it's, it's like perfectly put. That's exactly what we've experienced here in Michigan. And then I would also add the folks who have stayed, the folks who haven't left, are, have stayed for a reason, have stayed knowing that they have a responsibility and a duty that they have embraced passionately 
to stand and defend our democracy. And so, you know, this has been an undeniably challenging time and, and 2024 will be tough as well. Um, but having lived through 2020, I can say that on the other side of those challenges is a stronger and healthier, more robust democracy with filled with stronger um, devoted people, not that those who've left weren't, but the fact that when we have to move forward, we've got an influx of new folks who are who are signing up to do the job because of the job, because they're mission focused. And then we have folks who've stayed similarly because they're mission driven as well. And I was really, um, I experienced this firsthand when I was um, visiting pre precincts in election centers in November of 22, when we were on edge as to whether the threats we dealt with in 2020 would be back and in what way on election day. And every precinct I went to, there was more energy from election workers in those election centers than I'd ever seen in any election. People were excited. People were proud to be there. And it was rooted in this determination to ensure the anti-democracy forces and the misinformation and the lies would not succeed. And so the more folks we have like that on both sides of the aisle in the process and defending those already in the process, the, the best chance we've got at ensuring that um, that not only do we defeat the anti-democracy forces, but that we use them to become stronger than ever as a democracy. And Secretary Cisco, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, uh, if there was anything else to add about just this, This ha has, has this created any type of a vacuum that's being with, filled with right-wing extremists in, in the whole uh, election administrator space? Absolutely. And look, we have one of the most consequential Senate races coming up this cycle. You know, Jackie Rosen is an incredible senator. She's an incredible individual. And we need to return her to the Senate. I mean, without her there, I think this country will see some pretty tough situations. But in looking at her race and understanding what's happening in Nevada, Washoe County, where Reno is located, is a battleground county of the battleground state. And right now we have a certain individual who's an election denier. He's a conspiracy theorist. He's a QAnon member, holds two of those five seats in that county commission. He has, there are two seats up for re-election. He has candidates running in both of those seats. He's putting the resources necessary for those individuals to win. If he wins one of those two seats, he holds a majority of that county commission. He could then appoint himself the clerk of registered voters, and he could make our election system absolutely throughout the entire state. It is a situation that we need to take serious. These small local races are determining the future of our democracy. And we need to understand the individuals are trying to take control of them. They do it slowly. They do it silently. And then all of a sudden you realize what progress they've made and you have to stand up. I feel like Chicken Little running around Reno talking about this issue because this issue is not about Democrat or Republican races anymore. This is about the future of our state that is being held in one county out of the 17 in Nevada. Yeah. Um, let's go back to Secretary Benson. You know, we saw a, a good deal of militant groups show up at the at the uh, Michigan Capitol to basically intimidate voters and intimidate legislators there. Do you anticipate that that type of political violence will be an issue this go around? We've been very clear. I mean, yes, I think we should always hope for the best and plan for the worst and plan for every contingency. That's how we got through every election to this point. Um, I certainly hope that that's not the case, but we've also been very clear to anyone planning disruption, violence, uh, or any um, other types of threats or harassment, they won't succeed and there will be consequences, legal consequences, criminal consequences, uh, and uh, ultimately the consequences of a failure, a failed attempt, just as it was in 2020, to interfere with our democracy and the will of the people. So we were very clear going into 22, for example, uh, that if anyone tried anything, don't do it because you're not you're going to fail and then you're going to go to jail. Uh, and those rhyme. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have to be prepared for any of anyone to to make a, a um, you know, a bad decision uh, yet at the same and at the same time to seek real consequences. And I would add that the legal consequences we're already seeing pursued in Michigan and nationwide only helps us make that case even more and deter anyone attempting to do it. We also have a rapid response team in place throughout the state for every election to ensure if anything is attempted, we're there within five minutes to de-escalate. Uh, and we've trained our clerks in de-escalation practices as well so that we're there in case something happens. But obviously priority number one is to deter through the very clear message that it won't succeed and there will be consequences. Excellent. Um, Secretary Fontes, 
there's obviously a very substantial Latino population in Arizona. And by the way, there's the substantial uh, Latino population in Nevada as well. Um, but what is the biggest obstacle in facilitating their ability to vote? And how is that being rectified right now? Well, the obstacles facing the Latino community in Arizona are the same as the obstacles facing, you know, racial and ethnic and language minorities uh, across the United States of America. Uh, this is an issue that I think all of us have dealt with in a variety of different ways. Uh, but what we're doing is direct outreach. Um, you know, we're, we're actually going directly to the community, uh, holding roundtables, uh, recruiting more folks from those communities to work in our vote centers, in our election warehouses, and to actually take the full-time jobs. Uh, this is, the direct outreach is really what matters the most and, and really doing it in those communities uh, one of the tactics that we employed at Maricopa County, uh, and we're doing it here at the secretary's office as well, is actually hosting community events uh, in uh, churches and community centers and having the church or the community center invite the folks that they think uh, are part of those communities. We're not the ones setting uh, the guest list. We're letting them host their folks. We come in and then do our stuff because it gives the folks who are leaders in those communities sort of that vested interest. They are the ones uh, who are the, the partners uh, to help us uh, advance the agenda. It was very effective. It's one of the reasons why we had record turnout uh, and a record number of voters registered in Maricopa County. Uh, we added half a million voters to the voter rolls in the four years that I was there. And across the state of Arizona, we are uh, on pace uh, to do something similar uh, across the state once we get to the end of my, my term. Uh, and, and it really is about outreach. Uh, and, and I think you got to pay attention to all folks. We don't just look to the Latino population. However, in Arizona, we have an enormous uh, amount uh, of, we've got 22 or 23, I think it's 23 native tribes. Uh, you know, Navajo is the biggest. Uh, there are tens of thousands uh, of registered voters up there. Um, and we've got to outreach to those communities as well. Our, Asian American Pacific Islander communities. It's, 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 it's not just one group is what I'm saying. This philosophy has to extend to all of our uh, cultural, ethnic uh, and language minorities, uh, not just because the law says so, but because it's the right thing to do. Thanks. Um, Secretary Aguilar, Nevada is a universal vote by mail state, meaning that all voters receive an absentee ballot and they can fill that out at home. How does this impact elections in Nevada? And do you think that this is a change that could be transposed onto other states that don't have it? And, what, and I guess, what, if so, what's what's your pitch for, for states to be able to adopt this? Great. Look, Nevada's done a significant work in making sure that we have access to the ballot box for everyone. You know, we're a third Latino, but also, too, we have 27 tribes throughout the state. By universal mail ballot, we are able to increase participation by our Native communities of 25%. We are having a community engage in the electoral process that was shut out for so long. 25% is significant, but it's not enough. We've even gone further to allow Native communities to use our digital and mobile system to vote. So having every resident of a Native tribe be able to vote digitally, mobily, or using their mail-in ballot, or having a polling place. We also flipped the dynamic between the tribes and our clerks in the 17 counties. Before, the tribes used to have to make a request to the clerks to have a polling site on the tribal community. Now the clerks are automatically mandated to have that polling site. The tribes can determine if they want it, but now that dynamic has shifted and we've changed the argument. No longer will we be seeing court cases where the tribes are having to sue the local county clerk to be able to get a polling site. You know, we're continuing to fight to make sure we have that universal access. You know, we've expanded mobile digital voting to our communities that are homebound because a lot of times people, even though they have the mail ballot, it's still not practical to them given whatever difficulties or disabilities that they have. We're looking at this, we're continually on the defense about these issues because we know that some of our counterparts would like to strip these away and make it harder for people to vote. And we're gonna to continue to fight back. I'm proud of what Nevada has done. We're gonna to continue to work at it and we're gonna become the model state for the entire country of what ballot access looks like because every issue we care about runs through the ballot. And do you have a benchmark right now that you're looking to push for in terms of participation from these marginalized groups like like uh, like these Native American tribes and whatnot? Yeah, look, it's getting making sure that we are matching what's occurring throughout the entire state is the first benchmark to make sure every vulnerable community has that equal opportunity. It's the one time as Americans that we're all equal. We have one voice, we have one vote, and every time we exercise that, we are consistently on par with the rest of America. 
you know, Adrian talked about the Latino community in Arizona. Nevada has a similar makeup of Latinos. You know, again, I think for we take it, it for granted sometimes. And we need to realize that the Latino community is not a get out the vote population. It is a community of persuasion. And we have to be out there as elected leaders telling them what government is doing for them. And sometimes it's hard. But we also have to be present. And the fact that Adrian's out there engaging directly with the community is going to build a significant wave when the election time comes. We can't just show up a few weeks before election and say, please cast your vote for this candidate. We have to be there now and we have to continue to be there to be showing what it is that government's doing for them. Perfectly put. Uh, let's go to Secretary Benson. How did having abortion on the ballot in 2022 impact turnout in Michigan uh, in this last election? And do you think that that's a tool that could be deployed in states across the country, this issue of using the issue of protecting women's reproductive rights as a turnout tool? I mean, yeah, we saw record turnout, um, or the highest turnout midterm election, record turnout among women, among, among female voters. Of course, Michigan is um, run almost entirely by women at the executive level in particular. Uh, but what it really did, Brian, is kind of gets back to what you were saying earlier in, in the webinar about simplifying the message. We were able to simply say your fundamental rights and freedoms are on the ballot. Democracy is on the ballot along with your reproductive freedoms and, and your fundamental rights. Everywhere we went, every single statewide officer had that message. Simple, clean, true, that the choice voters were making would directly impact their right to vote in the future, their ability to have reproductive freedom in the state, and their protections of other fund fundamental rights that, that we as office holders have now sought to protect, like an expansion of LGBTQ uh, protections in the state of Michigan. So having, it, so having it on the ballot enabled us to crystallize and simplify the choice that was facing every voter in our state in 2022 uh, in a way that was both real and true and accessible to all. And I think we're going to see the same thing play out in this 2024 election cycle, because as the president said the other day, democracy is on the ballot. And that is true. The choice, uh, the likely choice between presidential candidates will be one in which democracy will be directly impacted by who the voter chooses. So being able to communicate to voters the direct impact of their vote in a way that affects them in a simple way really helped us uh, and, and, and had the greatest impact in driving turnout and engagement in our state in 22. Yeah, I love that. I think that's that's exactly the right uh, that's exactly the right move here. Um, I do want to extend that same question to to Secretaries Aguilar and Fontes. Can you speak on the state of abortion rights in in your respective states? Go ahead, Cisco. Yeah, in Nevada, the legislature voted this legislative session to move forward with the ballot initiative to put it in the state constitution. I see that initiative and that effort is really going to drive voter turnout, but it's also too going to protect a woman's choice, right? They should choose their ability to have an abortion. They should be able to have the choice to choose their own health care. And this is going to drive motor, you know, voter participation again. But then when you dig down deeper into our sub communities, especially our vulnerable communities, you have some religious issues that you need to address. And what are we going to do to engage them? And again, it goes back to our conversation about our Latino community and that direct engagement of building trust with them sometimes goes a little bit deeper than an issue itself. Secretary Fontes. Yeah, well, uh, our legislature wants to take us back to 1868, uh, as in so many places, but um, Arizona's for Reproductive Rights uh, have started an initiative here in the state. It's a citizen-run initiative. Unlike Nevada, it is coming uh, from the voters. They are actively engaged uh, in that campaign right now. They're going to need something north of 300 and I think it's 370,000 signatures. Uh, they'll probably want to get something double that. To get on the ballot, there will obviously be court challenges, uh, but this is part of what's going to turn out Democrats, and it's also going to bring a lot of those uh, independents and moderate Republicans over as well. People forget sometimes that uh, Barry Goldwater himself, Mr. Conservative, uh, was a fan of choice, and he was one of the folks who really got Planned Parenthood up and running back in the days, or at least uh, helped with that uh, here in the Grand Canyon state. So uh, is it going to help to have it on the ballot? Yes, uh, we're in the midst of uh, having some of our some of our chief prosecutors going back and forth, depending on what side of the aisle they're on, as to whether or not the laws that are on the books right now are a legal uh, or b uh, going to be enforced. So uh, it is a live issue in Arizona. It is uh, controversial. Uh, unfortunately, it shouldn't be. Uh, but we've got uh, a group of citizens who are 
hell bent on making sure that uh, every citizen has their basic fundamental rights and dignity respected, uh, particularly women and, and how they make their own medical choices. We're going to stay with you for a second, uh, Secretary Fontes. When you were running for local office, Republicans attempted to smear you by linking you to George Soros, who is the Jewish donor that Republicans love to scapegoat. Um, and, and that was in an effort that what the Anti-Defamation League is characterizing as uh, anti-Semitism. This anti-Semitic trope remains a key part of Republicans' playbook, even now, heading into 2024. Can you speak to how these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories affected your election and how how they interact with conspiracy theories about our elections in general? Well, they, they uh, had a direct uh, role to play in my election. I, I ran against an anti-Semite. He was an Oath Keeper. He was a January 6th uh, attendee at the uh, uh, insurrection. Um, and, and it's important because what it does is it, 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 it invites suspicion. It invites um, sort of this uh, general notion of, of doubt, and, and it raises the questions of the unknown. I, I'm absolutely certain that Secretary Benson and her fast work in these areas would probably be a little bit better equipped to answer some of the background rhetorical stuff and, and message meanings through this. But uh, we fought like hell against it, uh, and we called it out. We called it out directly. Uh, you know, I, I, I often am heard saying, if, if you don't want to be called a fascist, stop acting like a fascist. Uh, and I say that within uh, sort of the scope of the direct attack. Um, we have to be uh, stalwart and we have to be strong as against uh, folks who are going to be anti-Semitic, uh, who are going to be racist, who are going to be anti-democratic, who are going to be authoritarian. Uh, we cannot shy away from it because, well, they've got these insidious uh, sorts of messages we need to blare out, uh, sort of the anti-Americanism uh, that they that they uh, that they model. I feel like a like a debate moderator here, but Secretary Benson, your name was invoked. Uh, do you have anything to add just on this issue of of these anti-Semitic attacks and other uh, attacks that have been leveled against candidates? Yeah, I think it's exactly as as Secretary Fontes said, it's a way of, of using anti-Semitism to both continue to spread anti-Semitic tropes uh, through a, a, a goal of invoking fear and uh, ch challenging trust and making it seem as if there's some sort of um, false conspiracy happening. I mean, it was interesting. I was, uh, well, I don't want to go too much into the depth of the connections between the neo-Nazi and the white supremacist movement, but we see, you know, certainly there is a connection there and this, um, you know, very deeply held anti-Semitic conspiracy that underlines even, that under undergirds even um, the philosophy and ideology of white supremacy today. Um, all of it is, you know, being signaled by the former president uh, who was on the ballot in in 20 uh, and enabled by that. And so it's, it's but I, I think at the bottom line, we have to, more vocally draw those connections, as I was saying earlier, and call it out as, you know, this isn't an attack on, on you know, a mythical funding source and all the rest. This is an attack um, rooted in anti-Semitism and, uh, and, and stoking fears based on sort of false ideologies. Um, it's been the, the rule book and the playbook of anti-democratic un-American forces since the beginning of our democracy. And it's one that we have to continue to call out for what it is today uh, and fight it on on those grounds, uh, as opposed to getting into the, the sandbox and the messaging box of those who try to skirt over the anti-Semitism and try to say it's about something else. And by the way, just to build on exactly what you were saying, I think that the right does have a vested interest in embracing this kind of stuff, because so long as they can get people fighting about identity and anti-Semitism and conspiracy theories, then nobody's talking about their actual agenda, which is at the end of the day what they want, because their agenda is going to be, you know, tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires is going to be denying the effects or the legitimacy of climate change. It's going to be um, stripping women of their reproductive rights. So I think that they have a vested interest in keeping the conversation about this stuff. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, we have a vested interest in making sure that we're talking about stuff that's actually impacting people's lives. Yeah. Do, well, sorry, also yeah. Add, just on that note, I think we also have to recognize the overall goal of all of this is to get people to give up on democracy and to get people to give up on a diverse 
uh, uh, you know, possibly the, the, the first true racially diverse uh, democracy in our world, in our global history, uh, and, uh, and, and not participate and not believe in it and not believe in their voice and not believe in their power. And so that we also have to draw that connection as well, that the overall goal of whether it's anti-democracy forces overseas or anti-democracy forces here at home is to cause people to give up on democracy uh, and to use these anti-Semitic tropes and other means and lies as a way to do it. Uh, and um, that's, we have to be very clear and then respond to that as opposed to, as you said, getting in the um, you know um, weeds and sort of fighting on, on, on their turf, but simply call it out for what they're doing and then redirect to the actual work, why people should believe in democracy, why should be, people should have faith in the functionality of their voice and their power and the work that we want to do together and stay, um, you know, and, and, and again, um, draw the clear distinction between our message rooted in truth and inclusion and op opponent's message rooted in lies, anti-Semitism and other false tropes. Yeah, thank you. And I think for everybody watching, I mean, to see the work that you three are doing right now is is doing uh, uh, a good job unto itself in, in kind of um, uh, restoring our faith in, in that hard work and that democratic process. Uh, I want to go over to Secretary Aguilar. Unlike the other two secretaries on this panel, you serve with a Republican governor who was endorsed by Donald Trump. What's it been like serving in this role with a, a member of the Republican Party, and has it affected your ability to do your job? Or on the flip side, have you been able to find common ground? Both. You know, this legislative session, there were some, he introduced legislation to roll back some of our access. He wanted to eliminate universal mail ballots, which would take away that ballot box for a lot of communities. And I don't think he realized, once I showed him the data of what those policy decisions meant to him as a candidate and his election, I think he truly started to understand what those policies meant to him and to be able to win him over. And it's using data. We are fighting extremely hard. We asked for a $30 million appropriation to build a voter management, election management system, to be able to produce that data, to show in real time what we're doing to increase the access for all Nevadans across this state. Having that data and not making decisions off of you know what we feel from a gut perspective, but having real information to be able to share. It's our responsibility to take that data, share it with the rest of Nevada to show, hey, this is working. It's giving an opportunity for everybody to participate. But yes, it is hard because, you know, unlike the felony bill for protection of election workers, which received unanimous support from both houses and a signature from the governor, that was a great motivation, but it didn't stop there. We had to then quickly get on the defense to protect a lot of our voter access. Yeah, that was well said. Um, Secretary Benson, in 2010, so we're talking 13 years ago, before you even ran for office, you wrote a book called Secretaries, uh, State Secretaries of State, Guardians of the Democratic Process. This was, as I mentioned, a decade before the 2020 election and the efforts by Donald Trump to overturn the election results through intimidation expressly of those secretaries of state. When you wrote that book, did you expect that these issues would become mainstream and, uh, and that the spotlight would emerge on secretaries of state like yourself? You know, I did not expect an attack on our U.S. Capitol on January 6th. I did not expect, even like any of us did, the rise of a sort of anti-democracy force uh, in charlatan like Donald Trump. Uh, but I did expect uh, to see secretaries of state continue to be in the spotlight. And I did want to communicate to citizens everywhere the important role we have in electing our secretaries of state to be people who are stalwart defenders of the voice and the vote of every citizen. It was really uh, the 2000 election, now almost over 20 years ago, almost a quarter of a century ago, uh, in, when Catherine Harris, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, stopped a full recount from happening, which impacted the outcome of an entire presidential election. And so it was that election that to me as a young voting rights lawyer was seeking to make sure the Voting Rights Act was real for every citizen. When I saw, you know, we could as lawyers, as advocates, do everything we could from the outside. But if a secretary of state was unwilling to do their job on the inside, then everything else falls apart. And we saw that again in 2004, when Ken Blackwell in Ohio didn't put enough voting machines in Cleveland and Columbus, leading to eight hour wait times, again, arguably impacting a presidential election. So in 2008, when I started working on the book, my goal was to put a spotlight on these offices and make the case that, 
professionals committed to the rule of law and the constitution and democracy should be doing these jobs, not partisan officials. And that it was our job as voters to really ensure that was the case in Arizona where Jan Brewer was the secretary of state at the time. Uh, and uh, and even in, in my state of Michigan and in what happened after that election. And when I was writing the book, I was so inspired by the office and all the good things that could be done by secretaries of state, the positive things to impact and expand democracy that I sought to run for this office just to expand on that story and tell voters in our state, look, you can choose someone who's just a professional committed to your vote and your voice, and I'll be that person. And it was what propelled me to run for office, but really the book was rooted in this effort of recognizing that in every state, voters can do something to make sure Democrat or Republican, their elections are held and run by professionals. Well, thank you. And and actually, your your comments here um, kind of are going to inspire this last comment. And I, I started off this stream by asking what you foresee as being the biggest threats to our democracy in the coming year will be. I want to end it on a more hopeful note. So if we could just have a quick answer from all three of you, because I know we're coming to the end and, and we appreciate your time. A quick answer about what gives you hope uh, as we head into 2024 in your respective states. And we can start with uh, with Secretary Benson. Uh, what gives me hope is that even in the midst of a global pandemic and a historic, unprecedented, multi-state coordinated effort to under, undermine democracy and overturn the will of the people, democracy prevailed. And it prevailed because people of integrity on both sides of the aisle stood together firmly to ensure that it did. Uh, the you know democracy not just prevailed in 2020 and in 22, but it expanded. It got better. We got more colleagues like Cisco and Adrian now in positions of authority authority in their respective states to continue uh, protecting democracy. We've got more people serving as poll workers than ever before. So history will tell the story of this moment and one that democracy not just prevailed, but it's thrived in this moment because of people. Uh, and, um, and that gives me a lot of hope, even moving into this stormy season of 24, that will prevail yet again, because the American people will ensure that we do. Secretary Fontes? Yeah, what gives me hope is uh, young people are pissed off and they can come uh, to organizations like uh, JDCA and they can volunteer and they can get out the vote. It's it's a question of whether or not we're just going to flat out overwhelm the dark forces out there, uh, the anti-democratic forces, and that we use the process that we are defending to defeat them. We're, we're not going to we're not going to rely on threats. We're not going to rely on misinformation. We're going to rely on the rule of law and the process that we have in front of us, but we actually have to do the work. So I'm encouraged by the fact that, you know, we're not waiting until next July or, you know, next, next August, uh, once the conventions are over to really start focusing on this. We're, we're more than a year out from the 2024 election. And while there are primaries uh, and all kinds of elections between now and then, uh, it's organizations like this and so many others across the country that are actually making it happen uh, and getting folks engaged and involved. And, and I couldn't be happier about that. Uh, and I'm super glad to have been invited here. Thank you so much, uh, you know, Jocelyn, Cisco. It's always good to uh, appear with you. And Brian, uh, as always, I'm still proud to be the first guy to have appeared uh, with you on that new set of yours, which I think is just a little year, a year old now. So anyway, yeah. thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. And finally, uh, Secretary Aguilar. Look, we're known as a battleground state. We're here to battle. And the fact that I can have allies like Adrian and Jocelyn there with me, but also too, the 100 people on this Zoom, that's pretty incredible that they took the time out on, on a day like ours to listen to us talk about the issues that we are facing and willing to engage. That is really, truly the motivation is that people care and they're willing to fight for what they believe in. Well, thank you. I mean, I I, I know I speak for everybody in saying you know that that we couldn't we couldn't be more proud to have all you know three people like you on this panel i know probably what everyone's thinking is like thank god we have these badasses that are uh, defending democracy in these states that are especially important so uh, to the to the three of you thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to speak to us for everybody watching thank you also for taking the time out of your day to to stay involved in this stuff this is literally what what protects democracy from you know uh, people taking time out of their days in in October of an off year to listen to these people. So thank you. And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby. Excellent. Um, Brian, thank you so much. And thank you to Secretaries Aguilar, Benson, and Fontes for, for being with us today. And to all of you at home for spending that last hour with us, learning how you can take action 
on the road to 2024. As Secretary Benson uh, referred to, we are not giving up on democracy here at JDCA. And I know everyone who attended today is also not giving up on democracy. Uh, but some that are, uh, as we saw this week between the dangerous games being played to try and cause a government shutdown, the challenge of the speakership and motions to vacate, playing out now, and the second GOP primary debate last week, the Republican Party is unable to govern and isn't serious about addressing the issues that Americans care about. That's why now more than ever, it's imperative that everyone gets involved and stays involved. As Jews, we have a responsibility to work towards a country and a world uh, that is safer, more just, and offers everyone an opportunity to be a part of the political process, to have their voices heard and their vote counted. Our Jewish tradition implores us that while it's not our responsibility to complete the work, neither are we free to abstain from it, which is why here at JDCA, we turn that responsibility into collective action, and we hope you'll join us. To do so, please visit jewishdems.org and help us urge Congress to pass the Freedom to Vote Act by signing our call to action, which you can find in the Zoom chat. The freedom to vote is one of the most central pillars of our democracy, yet the GOP is determined to dismantle it. In 2023 alone, over 320 bills in 45 states have been introduced that restrict voting rights. This cannot continue, and we need your help. While on jewishdems.org, please subscribe to our email list to hear about all of our upcoming events, like future versions of this series. Join one of JDCA's state and local chapters and affiliates made up of passionate grassroots volunteers like yourself, and support JDCA and programs like this by making a financial contribution and by becoming a JDCA member to gain access to exclusive briefings throughout the year. We want to wish each of you a very happy Sukkot, Moadim Lasimcha, and thank you again for joining us. See you soon.